The views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. We're all familiar with the three what's, what it is, what it can do for me, and what does it cost. Tyler Rickenaut Country Financial can help you find the answers with insurance coverage to help protect what's most important to you, all at a price you can afford. So while you're juggling work and kids while trying to keep an eye on your financial future, Tyler Rickenaut Country Financial will make sure they are the first ones there when you need them most. The kids are back to school and your schedule is busier than ever. From daycare pickup, doctor's appointments, sports and college tuition, a parent's signature is a powerful thing. Have you ever stopped to think, what would happen if you weren't able to provide one? With thoughtful estate planning, you can make sure that your child's health and education needs are met in the event of your absence due to a temporary incapacity or even death. The estate planning team at Hurley Burrish is here to help. Fostering deeper relationships, influencing behavior change, developing resilience. You're about to start winning. Here is your host, Christine Bright. Welcome to Parenting Game. I am so glad you are here. Divorce and custody issues can be some of the most challenging things a family faces. These decisions are so emotional and parents can get pretty overwhelmed with the legalities. My guest today is attorney Ginger Murray, and she is going to help us answer some of these questions in the child custody prop process. Ginger, thank you so much for coming today. I appreciate you. I am excited to be here. Yeah, and before we dig in, share a little bit about your family. Oh, thanks for asking that. Um, so let me just give some credit to where credit is due. My parents are just <clears throat> amazing. My dad is a retired counselor, and so I always had the mental health support that I needed from my dad. My mom is a fearless woman, and it took me some years to figure out how much I was like her. I, I probably should have known a little bit when, uh, just because I was born on her 20th birthday. That's how much we are alike. Um, I'm married to a wonderful man who doesn't like me talking about him much, so I'll just tell you that he's a teacher at Lake Mills and a golf coach. Um, very proud mom of two girls, Jenna's at UW-Madison and Jaylee's getting ready to graduate here from Sun Prairie. We are in the final stages of picking the college that she'll be going to. Oh, how exciting. Yeah. Those are great times. And I, I got an episode coming up with uh, about sending your kids off to college. It is not easy. Yeah, it is college safety and conversations to have. There's a lot There's that a goes lot into and there. I'm very fortunate. She's a 4.0 student, so um, she got accepted to Madison, but she wants to go somewhere warm. Uh, she got accepted to Arizona with lots of money, but she wants to be somewhere bigger. <laughs> she got accepted to California at San Diego and South Carolina. So, um, Oh, that's so exciting that she has so many choices. Yeah, we've got it down to two. So. Yeah, and I don't know why she would want to go somewhere warmer. I mean, the snow <laughs> when it's supposed to be spring. I mean, you know, right. who doesn't like that? Yep. <laughs> so share with us, I, I like to ask this question to my guests because yep. we are speaking to parents. What is one thing that you've done well as a parent something you can pat yourself on the back for? I think the easiest thing and hopefully thing that all parents can say is just knowing that they're unconditionally loved. Like Absolutely. whether it's a good day or a bad day and no matter what decisions you make, everything's okay because you are unconditionally loved and I got your back. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your path of becoming an attorney mm -hmm. and why you chose family law. Um, it goes back to my freshman and sophomore years in high school. I was at a small school in Wabino, Wisconsin with 36 kids in my class, and those teachers allowed us to try mock trial, uh, which is new to Sun Prairie. Oh. Sun Prairie has a team now. But so I had this opportunity to, as a student in high school, to perform the part of an attorney. And when we were in competition, after my closing argument and being scored, Judge Kinney pulled me aside and said, kids, you've really got something. He's like, if no one's told you this, I'm telling you now, I think you could be a lawyer. And then I came back the second year and he's like, I can't wait to see what you're gonna do. And so off I went to Madison for undergrad, went down to Mississippi for law school. At first I thought I was gonna be a criminal defense attorney. 
Um, for better or worse, I worked with Tom Fortner and did capital murder defense cases in Mississippi. Oh my goodness. But I think my dad being a counselor and having given his life to counseling kids who were having troubles with school, and I think that family background that you asked about made me like just stick on the course with family law instead. And so I had done juvenile cases and I had done these capital murder cases, but by the time I got back to Wisconsin, it really became clear that family law was my thing. And Judge Kennedy was the judge in Forest County and he quickly started appointing me as guardian ad litem. And then within three years, he appointed me as the family court commissioner where I was presiding over family cases. And a lot of people think that divorce is bad and it has like a negative connotation, but I see it as an opportunity to make changes for the better. And so, mm -hmm. I feel that kids in those families that are going through the divorce benefit from me helping their families get through that well. Oh, I really like that perspective that you bring Thanks. because I know with parents, and we may get into this discussion a little bit, carry so much guilt. Mm -hmm. And in that process, it can really affect their parenting. The other thing that I love is, you know, you've done the guardian ad litem and you've had these other positions before you became an attorney. Has that really helped you then? Right. When you're, you get all those pieces because you actually worked them. Well, and thank you for pointing that out. So when I was an attorney, then I wanted to be the guardian ad litem so I could just, what's best for kids. And I mm -hmm. felt like that has to be the best job you can ever do. And it truly is knowing that the, your sole focus is what's best for the children. But sometimes when you're working with the kids, it's hard to motivate change for the parents. Mm -hmm. And so then I was like, judge, you gotta let me be on the bench. You gotta help me you know, do more. And so then I was a court commissioner for five years and I got to make those initial decisions. And the initial decisions are when you know the, the wounds are deep because they've just filed and there's a lot of chaos and people don't know what the rules are. And so that was a very rewarding position. But I was in that upper level position in small communities in Forest County and Oneida County. And my husband wanted us to move to a bigger city. So we moved down to Madison. So I started over as an attorney at Lawton and Cates. And now I have my own business, Your Family Law Center. And I get to bring all of that background to my clients. Like, here's what I think your guardian ad litem is going to want you to do. Here's the things that I can tell you from the bench that I think work well for families. And this is what I get to do to advocate for you. And this is how I think we should go forward. So, yeah. I, I love that. I went through your website and I was really impressed about how much information you gave on your website. But then again, overwhelming, all yeah. these different terms that have to be navigated in a time when you are in crisis. And what I love and why I want to do this episode is parents do have a choice mm -hmm. to do this well. It's not going to be easy. It's, you know, it, we're not talking like, you know, you're going to come out friends and this is all going to be great. But you do have a choice of doing things well and not well. Mm -hmm. Part of it, a lot of it is understanding. I've seen friends go through this and now they're learning this along the way. and taking in all this information. So I love that we're gonna break down. Can I comment on that? Yeah. So what the website is meant to do is just give people the language, the terms that they're going to be hearing to help prepare them for the first discussion and so that when they're at the first discussion with me, if they forget part of it, there's an easy space to go to to relearn it on your own. But when you meet with me, that's when we talk about how these words apply to your life and then if you misunderstood a word or mm -hmm. just were trying to remember how it, <clears throat> excuse me how it fits together you can go back to the website and that's free you uh, can do that I, all day long yeah, yeah it's it's excellent thank you um so let's get into just clarifying some of the different terms mm -hmm. which I've been involved with parents with divorce too, but there were some little nuances. I was like, oh, I, I didn't know this. It was actually really good for me too. But what is the difference between physical custody and legal custody? And so I'll make it even easier. In Wisconsin, it's really custody or placement. In other states, they have physical custody and legal custody. In Wisconsin, we have custody and placement. And because we watch TV and TV might be in whatever state, sometimes the language comes in very different. Custody is who's gonna make the major decisions. So for example, um, religion. Is a child gonna be baptized or otherwise introduced to a religion? 
Um, choice of school, public or private. Uh, are we gonna sponsor kiddos to get their driver's license? Those are major decisions, um, elective medicals. The law presumes that the parents should have joint legal custody, so both parents have an equal say in that, but we wouldn't need lawyers if the law was that easy. There are always exceptions, and that's when lawyers are very important, um, specifically if there's chemical abuse, um, mental health issues that might be untreated, domestic abuse. Um, the presumption is that both parents have equal voices in the conversation. So if there's something else going on that there's not equal voices, then maybe we're gonna give sole custody and only one parent will make those major decisions. Placement is whatever works best for the family. So the courts have to look at what's in the child's best interest about how often the child is gonna be at which home. How many days a week will the child be at this house with mom? How many days at the will the child be at the other house with the other parent? Um, and really, that's what parents tend to get most concerned about. How often am I going to get to spend time with the children? Mm -hmm. But there are as many answers as you can come up with. You know, and it's the neat thing about math. So there's 14 days in two weeks, but there's so many different ways to get there. In math, you can know that an answer is seven, but is that four plus th three or is it nine minus two? And what I mean is there's just so many different ways to get to the right answer for your family. But it takes what I like to call needs-based results. So you need to know what makes sense in this house and what makes sense in this house in ways that we are producing results that are best for the kids. And that takes getting to know the family to figure out what works best. Oh, and that's excellent that you want to take the time to figure that out and for parents to know that there is some choice mm -hmm. and, and freedom. I think a lot of parents go in thinking it's going to be cut and dried and now they're bringing in all this panic. But there mm -hmm. is some freedom and some choices that can be made within, within that. So. There's also, can be sole custody, joint custody. Is this determined, is sole and joint custody determined during placement? Is this a separate decision? What does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> That's a multifaceted question, but let me boil it down the best that I can. So first of all, the law presumes that both parents are to be involved in all decisions until there's a court order that says something different. So as long as we're talking about someone who's legally recognized as a parent, mm -hmm. and there's a whole bunch of other things out there that families could yeah. be that aren't legally recognized as parents. But when you're legally recognized as parents, you have the same decision-making authority and you have the same rights for placement. And so why? One of the reasons why it can be most scary up front is nobody knows what that first order is going to look like and what's going to happen when that pleading gets filed. That's probably the scariest time. But we get to go into court and ask for temporary orders in front of court commissioners, that role that I used to have, to set the first set of rules. Um, and we're going to talk about custody and we're going to talk about placement. There has to be some pretty significantly concerning facts for the court to do anything other than joint legal custody at that temporary order. Um, some of those significantly concerning facts would be if someone was charged with child abuse, if um, someone's gone to jail, someone's gone because of military, mm -hmm. but otherwise that first order is often going to be joint legal custody. And if there's a dispute about custody or if there's a dispute about placement, who's gonna spend time where, the courts have these tools in their toolbox. First of all, they're going to send the family to mediation in almost all cases. And so the family is gonna go talk to a mediator and see if that person who has no interest in the case can help the parents come up with an agreement. Sometimes we get guardians ad litems right away if there's a real cause for concern for the well-being of the kids. So that's an attorney appointed by the court to investigate and recommend what that attorney thinks is best for kiddos. But the court has an obligation at that temporary order to set a placement schedule. And so you need to be prepared when you go in okay. there. One thing is the court is gonna look at historically who's been taking care of the kids on a regular basis. And if there is a parent who's been the primary parent during the marriage, they feel very entitled that that should continue that way. And that's a reasonable position to take. But it's also reasonable that when you were married and you set these roles, one was breadwinner, one was homemaker, now that we're separating, 
the rules are going to change too. And so yes. the other person who wasn't previously involved may prove to be a really good parent and step up to the plate and do more engaged parenting. Time will tell. Yeah. Yeah. And so temporary orders can be amended later. And the law requires a 120 day waiting period from the time you file and tell final orders to give you at least four months to see what fits for your family. Oh, that is so good to know. Because again, I know parents coming in with all of this anxiety mm -hmm. and they feel decisions are gonna be made and permanent right. <laughs> right out of the gate. But the court system has set up these waiting periods and processes mm -hmm. so that does not happen. And that they will give you more time because once there is that final order, it's really hard to change it for two years because the law wants people to be settled and not coming back to court quickly. Yeah. And so it's really important to spend the time to get that right fit before you lock in the terms because that's what you're gonna live by for two years is the presumption. Okay, Oh, and we're gonna get into that yeah. a little bit too. So first, you mentioned mediation. Yes. Um, what that, all, describe a little bit more what that looks like and where do you get a mediator? Yeah. Where do you find them? <laughs> There's many choices, which is the good news. It didn't used to be that way. So first of all, the law requires the county to have a mediation process within the county's um, uh, structure. So in Dane County, we're very fortunate. We have a team of great mediators. So if you're a Dane County case, there's a team of them on the second floor at the courthouse, and they're going to have you go to a parenting education course first. And that is not to teach you how to parent. It is to teach you the language of uh, placement and custody okay. and you know the words that are, we're going to be using as we craft these orders. And then they're going to spend time talking with both parents to see if they can help um, find out what's the gap between the two positions and see if they can help bridge that. And they even offer extended mediation in Dane County. So that's the county's mediation. I will also tell you that most attorneys like myself are going to try and solve that by agreement before we go into a courtroom. Like if there's room for agreements, good family law attorneys are going to be trying to get those agreements straight out of the gate. Also, family law attorneys serve as mediators. So do some um, mental health professionals can serve as mediators. And there's an abundance of them now more so after COVID, I think, because we needed to find more ways to get all of those families yeah. through the process when the courtrooms weren't so easily available. So um, you can go to my website and I have a list of mediators and you can go to the Dane County Family Courts website and they have lists of mediators. There are many, many available from all different walks of life, whether retired judges, attorneys, mental health professionals, um, there's a lot available. <laughs> That is so good to yes. know. Also, guardian ad litems, mm -hmm. scary word. <laughs> I, I do have parents come to me who are going through divorce and, and uh, parent classes were recommended. Yes. So they come to me and then I talk with the guardian ad litem mm -hmm. and you can just hear in their voice, they're like, oh, we have a guardian ad litem. And I think they get tagged as like kind of bad people and they're really not. So explain the yeah. purpose of a guardian ad litem, what they do, and that we don't have to look at them as somebody working against you. That, well, I think it's scary for parents because the guardian ad litem has a lot of influence on the court. So I think that they're not bad people, they just are powerful people and you don't know what they're thinking. And good guardians ad litem will not let you know what they're thinking. Um, they, they start out as a very neutral process. Let me back up. First, the judge or court commissioner has to sign an order approving this person to be the attorney selected to represent your children's best interest. So I think if you think about what an awesome responsibility that is for mm -hmm. someone who's never met your children, you can understand, one, why the courts need them because the Courts don't have time to go interview teachers and counselors or parenting coaches or babysitter or care providers. Yeah. Um, so that attorney has that responsibility to get as much information that's relevant about the kids because they have this awesome responsibility to report to the court what they think is in the child or children's best interest. They are required to report to the court what the child's wishes are 
Um, but you might imagine one child might like the house with the Corvette rather than the one with the station wagon. <laughs> or the one so, with the pool. <laughs> right, with the playground. Or Yes. And, and we get that question all the time. I'm kind of off point on your question, but a lot of families ask this. When can kids make their own choices? Mm -hmm. They don't. Children don't make choices. They're children. Yeah. But as they get older, their thoughts have more influence on a guardian ad litem. But the guardian ad litem's job is to be neutral until they're not. Once they have come to that recommendation in their mind about what's best for kids, now they're advocating for that position. And so sometimes feeling that change from when that person was neutral to now understanding that the recommendation has come out, yes. that could feel threatening to the other parent. And no matter what you tell that parent, it's going to feel threatening, but that attorney's job is to represent what he or she thinks or they think is in the children's best interest. Yeah, and that is a weighty place to be. Yes. I, I do not, I've, I've always had empathy for what they do and have an yes. understanding. It is hard to convey that to parents, that they, they have a very weighty um, decision to make. And th it's not their decision, so they get out of that, because the judge still has to make the decision. But you're right, to have to make that recommendation. Here's one thing I, I thought, just thought of that could maybe help parents. A guardian ad litem can protect your child's therapeutic relationships. Um, some attorneys liked the old days when we brought everybody into the courtroom and laid all the dirty laundry on the table for the court to hear about. I think more common practice now is the guardian ad litem talks to the counselor so that the counselor doesn't have to testify so we oh, don't break that child's yes. therapeutic relationship with the therapist. So. If, if all you can take from it is at least this person let my child stay connected to their therapist, that's another way of looking positively at the role of a guardian ad litem from both parents, one would hope. Yeah, that is a very important <laughs> point. I'm glad that you brought yeah. that up. It's a piece that I didn't think about. So once recommendations are made and submitted to the court, yes. there can also be, and the guardian ad litem does this, this custody study. What what are the outcomes? What is the process? So this custody study has been done, and you and you explain that they're talking to teachers and counselors and everybody involved with that child. It is now set to the court. What are the possible outcomes now that yep. that report has been submitted? And I'm going to rewind just a minute because different counties have different resources. So in Dane County, we also have the ability to have a custody evaluator from that second floor team that is doing a separate custody evaluation, but then becomes the expert witness for the guardian ad litem. So you actually have two people, one who can testify and one who's the lawyer. Now, when I was up in the smaller counties, and we have smaller counties in the surrounding mm -hmm. area here, um, sometimes the guardian ad litem does all the work and that gets a little more complicated. But I just wanted to make clear that we can have a specific custody evaluator who is more of like the um, social worker, someone with a lot of experience in um, family relationships um, that does the actual custody evaluation that's working alongside of the guardian ad litem who's doing the investigation and has to make that legal recommendation. Just okay. wanted to clarify yeah. that. All right, so now for results. Um, more often than not, it's going to be joint legal custody. So legal custody, if there's really something that's gone wrong between the ability for the parents to cooperate. We also have this thing called impasse, where we can say it's going to be joint legal custody. Both parents get to be involved in the conversation about the decision. But if there's still a dispute, the court could give one parent tie-breaking authority. So that's the, the navigation on the custody. On the placement, it truly is. As many ideas as you can come up with, the court will adopt that, especially if the parents are agreeing to it. I did just have a case, I was so surprised. Mom had the, the daughter like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and dad had the son, and then they flipped it, but then they alternated weekends with both kids. And I'm like, that is a lot to remember. And she's like, we've been doing it for 18 months and our kids are fine. And it gives each kid um, separate time with each parent and they do better when both siblings aren't together. That's very unusual. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying is the imagination is the only limit for the different types of results that you can have. People might wanna hear that there are more common things. Um, for little kids, we've learned from child development professionals mm -hmm. that 
they should see both parents more frequently. And so that may be one day with mom, next day with dad. Um, child psychologists and therapists tell us that kids probably shouldn't be away from a bonded parent more than one overnight per year of life. So sometimes we schedule something for kiddos that are little that may need to be revisited later. So if you have a child who's over seven, as a final order, they may be able to go one week with one parent and the other week with the other parent, if that works well as a shared placement arrangement. But I cannot describe to you how many different possibilities there are because it's endless. And that just takes the parents being able to take some time and have some conversations. Mm -hmm. So this can go well. Yes. It's parents putting aside some of that hurt and taking the time to have these conversations. You know, if you don't mind, you said something earlier about parent guilt. Mm -hmm. That is something that I deal with yes. every time I have the initial consult. You know, if you think back historically, it was, you know, shameful to get divorced. Yes. Um, and parents were always worried about the negative impact on their children, which is a reasonable fear. I challenge parents to look at it differently. What is the outcome if you don't make a change? What are you modeling for your children right now? Are you in a healthy relationship? Or are you in an unhealthy relationship and do you want to, you know, to perpetuate that cycle through your children or do you want to break that cycle for your children? And so I think if you can just frame it differently, this isn't about being shameful. At, at this day and age, you know, 50% of marriages don't make it. We mm -hmm. understand that. So it's a little more commonplace and not so shameful. But if you just ask the parent, what is your child seeing you do? Is this the best person you can be or is a change needed? Oh, I love that. That is that is going to be so helpful to so <laughs> many you. parents going through this process. I mean, I went through it. And unfortunately, that parent guilt really kicked in heavy for me. And, you know, it went well, but my son and I are having some conversations now that he's older of how alone he felt yeah. because I was so overwhelmed with my guilt and couldn't support him. And so I love having these conversations yeah, with parents. You. Let's shed that mm -hmm. guilt because you're not going to make good choices if that's where they're coming from. Right. And you are just such a powerful attorney to be able to notice that and help parents walk through that. Thank you. Um, so you did talk about, I did want to make a little time and we are out of it. So you're going to have to come back <laughs> because I do want to talk about child support and all that goes into that. And we didn't even touch it. You know what, um, Christine, the money part of it could be a whole nother show. I know. You get the important stuff first. We talked about the kids first. That's always the most yeah, important thing. So, so I will have you back to do that. Um, so go ahead and just quickly share with us your website. Yourfamilylawcenter.com. Oh my gosh, thank you. Thank this you. This was so helpful. <laughs> I'm excited to have you back. And thank you for tuning in to The Parenting Game. We're all familiar with the three what's. What it is, what it can do for me, and what does it cost? Tyler Rickenau, Country Financial, can help you find the answers with insurance coverage to help protect what's most important to you all at a price you can afford. So while you're juggling work and kids while trying to keep an eye on your financial future, Tyler Rickenau Country Financial will make sure they are the first ones there when you need them most. The kids are back to school and your schedule is busier than ever. From daycare pickup, doctor's appointments, sports and college tuition, a parent's signature is a powerful thing. Have you ever stopped to think? What would happen if you weren't able to provide one? With thoughtful estate planning, you can make sure that your child's health and education needs are met in the event of your absence due to a temporary incapacity or even death. The estate planning team at Hurley Burrish is here to help. Thank you for watching The Parenting Game. All episodes of The Parenting Game are available on demand at sunprairiemediacenter.com.